Good morning, everyone. I'm Tony Fulmer, and we're at Chalet Nursery here for a, uh, a real class today. And um, this is something that Jennifer Brennan and I uh, concocted a number of years ago, and it's actually a horticultural quiz. So I want you to get a piece of paper and a pencil because I want you to be honest and keep track of your scores at the end of this, and then you're going to grade yourself so you can create your own curve so everybody can get an A. But it's, um, it's kind of interesting. Um, we've grown up with all these things that our parents or our friends or our neighbors have told us. In fact, I'm always surprised at how many people um, take the advice of their neighbors um, and then question the advice of horticulturists here. So it's, uh, it's, this is one of those things that will give you an opportunity to test your knowledge about the things that you think you know that are right and the things that maybe you're not so sure of. So this is a 24, per, a 24 question true false uh, quiz. And uh, so let's get, let's get started on this. My able assistant is here helping me. There's the share screen. Okay. Okay, there we go. Okay, we're going there. I, I, since you don't have the benefit of having this in front of you, there are five different uh, topics. We have general gardening, watering, fertilizing, I'm sorry, six. Fertilizing, pruning, turf, and earth-friendly techniques. So uh, got those pencils, those number two pencils sharpened. And be sure if you're taking this with someone else at home, make sure that you're social distancing so that you're not looking at someone else's paper. Okay, here we go. True, false. Peat moss is a readily available source of organic matter and is a great universal amendment for all soils, whether sandy, loam, or clay. I'll give you a second to think about that. Peat moss is a readily available source of organic matter and is a great universal amendment for all soils. Okay. This one is a is false, and there are two kickers in there. Uh, first one is readily available. So I think that depends upon your definition of readily available. Um, you know, this is not a uh, readily renewable resource. Um, there is a finite amount of peat, and so that is causing some concern uh, about the availability of it in the future. And But even if that was the not a consideration. The important thing there is the word universal. Um, because our soils in the Chicago land area are so universally um, heavy clay, um, unless you live along the sand ridge along Lake Michigan, that you have these very, very tiny little clay particles that pack very, very tightly. And so that means that this dense clay does not have a lot of oxygen spaces, and so it doesn't drain well. So when you're looking for an amendment, you're looking for something that has larger particle size, such as dehydrated manure, uh, your own compost, chalet compost, um, even cotton burr, anything that has a large particle size, when you start mixing that and incorporating that with your uh, clay soils, that will start opening up the, particle, the um, air spaces in the soil so that the water can percolate through and that you can get oxygen in there to the root system. So we actually do not recommend peat for people uh, with clay soils. The people that should be using peat moss um, would be people that, have, that know that they have a sandy soil because peat holds 10 times its weight in water. So it's a little bit like throwing a sponge in there. And for those of you that have a soil with a high sand component, that really makes a difference and that will be very helpful. It is not helpful when you have um, a heavy, dense clay soil. So number one, peat moss is false. True or false, always plant the top of any plant root ball, even with the surrounding soil grade. We're missing width in there. Always plant the top of any plant root ball, even with the surrounding soil grade. Well, generally speaking, that is true. There are, of course, like all things, um, anytime in a true-false question you see always, uh, that should have been the tip-off. So with this one, there are um, 
exceptions, both planting higher and planting lower. So the things that are exceptions for planting um, a little bit lower would be things like clematis, tree peonies, and roses that are grafted. Those should all be planted anywhere from one to two inches below the grade that they are growing in the pot. So if you, when you take them out of the pot, so again, it's clematis, tree peonies, and grafted roses, you should plant one to two inches below the grade. And you're probably wondering why that is. That is because you want to stimulate roots on those stems. And in the case of clematis, for those of you, any of you that have ever had clematis wilt, if you plant it level with the soil and the plant dies right to the ground, then you don't have any reserve buds to start growing and um, replacing the plant because clematis wilt doesn't have to be fatal. So if you plant a clematis two inches deeper than it's growing in the pot, if something should happen to the stems and it gets a fungal disease then, and it dies to the ground, you will have reserve buds on those stems, that two inches of stems that are below the soil surface. And the hope is that if you get rid of the disease portion of the plant, that that clematis will start regrowing. Tree peonies, it's the same thing because they're grafted. You just want the um, grafted variety, the special variety, not the rootstock. You want that to start rooting for additional hardiness. And with grafted roses, um, that can be confusing because in books for national publication, what it always says is, plant level with a graft union. And the graft union is that golf ball size knob that you see the stems arising from. So for example, if you had a Mr. Lincoln rose, um, the Mr. Lincoln is grafted onto a different uh, rootstock to impart hardiness to it, especially winter hardiness. So it's important to plant that one to two inches below the surface. If that graft union freezes, that's the end of that rose plant. So the exceptions again are clematis, tree peonies, and grafted roses should be planted two inches below the surrounding surface. Um, on the other hand, rhododendrons, azaleas, um, fruit trees, or if you have just a poorly drained soil and you want to give a plant a better chance, it is never, ever, ever wrong to plant it a little bit higher, an inch or two higher, uh, or in the case of a shade tree or a major shrub that has a big root ball, you can plant that with a quarter or a third of the root ball above grade and then mound away to that. Because what you're trying to do is increase the oxygen um, to the soil, to the root system rather, and uh, that will make a big difference. So, and in particular, with rhododendrons and azaleas, that's the only way we recommend planting them. We recommend doing the uh, Lots and lots of incorporation of shredded pine bark in there and then planting the plant literally with the root ball about a third above grade and then mounding it because rhododendrons and azaleas like a really highly oxygenated coarse soil that the water runs right through. So that one is false. Always dig planting holes for trees and shrubs twice as deep as the root ball. Okay, thinking about that one. Always dig planting holes for trees and shrubs twice as deep as the root ball. Um, I've been in horticulture for a long time. I, you know, I'm first to admit it, I'm old. So I have been doing this for 52 years now. So a lot of the things that I'm talking about here today are things that I grew up with and the research has changed uh, over the years and given us different information and better better information and better answers. And so when I started out, the standard thing that I would, was supposed to tell customers was, you dig planting holes for trees and shrubs twice as wide and twice as deep as the root ball. We do not say that anymore. Uh, research indicates that you want that, when you put that plant in the bottom of the hole, it needs to be resting on firm soil. So in a perfect world, what you would do is you would measure the depth of the root ball and then you would measure the hole, um, the planting hole, before you put the plant in. And again, as I mentioned early, in the earlier question, it's better to have it a little higher than too low. So measure the, measure the depth of the ball. Now, if you want to make it twice as wide, if you have the energy to do that, take the energy that you've saved, 
from making that hole twice as deep. So make it just as deep as you need to accommodate the root ball. So the finished plant, the top of the root ball is just level with the surrounding soil surface. Um, wider is better if you have the energy to do that. So, so far um, we've had three questions and we've had three false answers. Drainage material, that is gravel, sand, plastic, those plastic packing peanuts, et cetera, should be added to the bottom of containers to improve drainage. Um, this is one, and again, the kicker there is should be, and the, the answer is really shouldn't be added to the bottom of containers to improve drainage. The research has been done, and the only thing that you are doing um, is you are lessening the weight. If you have a really, really, really giant container, you are lessening the weight if that container has to be mobile for any reason. But what you're actually doing when you're putting things in there underneath the potting media that you're using, you're shortening the drainage column. And so what will happen is as you water, the water will go all the way through the potting soil. And the minute it hits something different in texture, like gravel or sand or those peanuts, what will happen is the water will tend to move laterally and will tend to start to rise a little bit before it finally starts soaking through there. So you really, um, it's much, much better if you go ahead and take the soil all the way to the bottom of the container. And the other thing about that is you'll have a deeper root system you'll have healthier plants, you'll have bigger plants in your container, and you also won't have to water as often because you have a bigger uh, volume of soil. So that seems to, you know, it's, it's very logical, um, but maybe we're not always logical. Now, this also applies, we need to take this a step further. It's not just containers that this is um, false for. It is also false, the worst thing that you can do is to dig a planting hole in the clay soil and put gravel in the bottom for drainage. If you think about this, it's a little bit like putting a stopper down the bathtub, putting gravel in the bottom and starting to fill it up with water. That gravel doesn't do anything. It doesn't take the water anywhere. The water just sits and then it finally starts rising up to where the root system would be. So this one is false, and this is really kind of an important one. Um, you really don't want to do this. Always, always, always um, take the potting material, your potting medium, and take that all the way to the bottom of the container. Don't shorten that drainage column. Newly planted trees should be staked securely. This is another one that uh, I grew up with and the research has been done by universities all over the country and all over the world and they've all come back with the same uh, results. Have you ever noticed when you're driving out in the country and you come to a woodland, uh, the trees at the edge of the woodland are shorter and then as you move into the center, the trees are taller. Well, that's in response to the wind. So nature in her infinite wisdom, when a plant is exposed to wind, it takes the tree back and forth. And the research indicates that it causes a heavier root system, a denser root system. The tree responds to that wind by making more roots and anchoring itself better. And it also stays, while it might stay a little shorter, it will develop a thicker, heavier trunk caliper much more quickly. So the two exceptions to this, where it is a good idea to stake a tree, is if the tree is on the side of a steep slope and you're literally planting on an angle like this, um, then it's a good idea to stake it. But again, that, that stake is really a crutch. And as soon as you can, you feel like the tree is rooted in and established, you wanna get those stakes off of it and let the action of the wind um, work on that tree and help it develop a heavier root system. The other thing is if you are um, someone who likes to buy big, big trees, you know, five or six inch diameter trees, and the root ball is proportionately too small for the top and the plant tends to be top heavy. Um, if you are buying a tree like that, which hopefully you shouldn't ever be, the root system should always be somewhat proportionate to the top of the tree. So if you have a tree that for whatever reason um, is a little bit top heavy, 
then again, you can go ahead and stake it. Uh, but once again, just like the case that I talked about where if it's planted on an angle, um, you want to take those stakes off as soon as you can take the tree and move it and you get resistance and you feel like it is really anchored in well. And just um, um, a free sidebar note to that is when you buy a tree, you should allow for, our rule is, the horticultural rule is, you should allow for one year of recovery time per inch of trunk diameter. So if you buy a three inch trunk, di a three inch diameter tree, it's really going to be three full years before that tree has regenerated all of the roots that were lost in the digging, has reestablished, and after three years, you'll finally start seeing the leaves be completely full sized, you should have a full complement of leaves after three years, and that's when you really finally see uh, the tree starting to take off and grow. So again, uh, newly planted trees should be staked securely. Um, this is generally false with those two exceptions that were mentioned. Tree roots extend only as far as the drip line. And again, that old saw about true-false question, as soon as you see one uh, extreme or another only. That is not true. Research again indicates that tree roots can easily, on a mature tree, can easily be extend 50 to 75 percent or more beyond the root line if they are uninhibited by any kind of uh, paved material or anything that um, stops the oxygen to the root system. So if a tree is in a uh, if it's a street tree, for example, or if it's a city tree where it's in a three by three square uh, of concrete, um, it will only, it won't even extend to the drip line. But the thing we have to understand is roots, it's as important for roots to get oxygen as it is for our lungs. And so as long as there is an opportunity for roots to um, be exposed where they can, where the soil will have a, an oxygen component in it, roots will go there. When that, is, when that is taken from them, then they will only grow and develop in those areas where there is, um, is oxygen. How are you doing so far? Uh-huh, okay. Bulbs planted upside down won't grow. Now, many of you that have taken Jennifer's class on bulbs in the past, um, this is actually false and Tricking bulbs um, is actually something that you can do. You can actually change the um, uh, bloom time or the bloom response on a bulb. So what you could, what some people do in the same area, you can take the same variety of, of tulips, let's say, and you can put one third of them pointing straight up the way you're supposed to. You can put one third of them horizontally and you can put the other third literally upside down. And what will happen is there is something in the root system that will respond to gravity. It's called geotropism. And the plant, the bulbs that are like this and the bulbs that are upside down will gradually um, turn in response to gravity and they will right themselves. But what will happen is there'll be a delay. So the bulbs that were planted upright will flower first perhaps five to 10 days ahead of the ones that were planted like this. So then these will have righted themselves and then they will bloom. And then the third that you planted upside down will be five to 10 days later than the bulbs that were planted horizontally. So it's not a matter of they won't grow, it's just that it slows them down and it slows the response time down and they will bloom a little bit later. You can only do that once because they will have them righted themselves and then theoretically they will all bloom together the following year. That's a pretty cool, aren't they? Okay, this is for people that have acid loving plants. And what are those acid loving plants? Things like rhododendrons, azaleas, hollies, um, blueberries in particular are really, really strict. Don't plant blueberries unless you're going to do them either in a container where you can control the soil mix that you're using so that you have a highly, highly, highly acid medium, um, or you do a real uh, complete um, soil amendment situation in the ground. 
So aluminum sulfate is a longer lasting acidifying agent than so soil sulfur. And that is not true. There are, those are the two options for acidifying and aluminum sulfate. Um, my colleague, Jennifer, uh, I love the analogy that she's used in the past many, many, many times. Um, aluminum sulfate is a little bit like the chocolate candy bar. You know, it is a quick sugar rush. It's a quick fix, but the energy and the effect doesn't last very long. Whereas if you use the soil sulfur as an acidifying agent, it's a little bit like the complex uh, pasta carbohydrate meal, the pasta meal. Um, the marathoners might have the night before they're going to, to have the big race. The soil sulfur is much slower to act and to start changing the pH. Uh, but once it does, then the effect is much, much, much longer lasting. Now, there's that being said, in our soil, you have to constantly, if you're working on any of the crops that I mentioned before, uh, particularly rhododendrons and azaleas and the blueberries, you have to, because our soils are so alkaline, you have to really work. And, you know, the other thing I should mention at this point in time is the other application for this is so many people are planting the pink mop head hydrangeas. And those are the ones that could be pink or they can be blue based on soil acidity. So a lot of people, um, you know, they don't want pink, they want blue. So this is again, a case where you would be using aluminum sulfate um, and or the soil sulfur. And I know the question will arise at the end of the class. And by the way, um, jot down, I failed to mention earlier, jot down your questions and you can submit them. And we, I will go ahead and try and answer as many as I possibly can on, the, uh, on air at the end of the program. So with the sulfur, uh, you incorporate that. The general recommendation, if you haven't taken a soil test, we recommend one heaping cup in the planting hole. Um, and then thereafter, it depends upon the crop with rhododendrons. You might want to top dress that with sulfur once or twice a year. Uh, but if when you're using the sulfur uh, as a top dressing after the plant is established, you have to pull the organic matter uh, or the mulch away from the top all the way to the edge of the, at least the drip line. And then you have to apply that secondary cup over the top directly in contact with the soil. If you put soil sulfur on top of mulch, the organic matter in the mulch will just tie that up and it will not acidify the soil. So one cup in the planting hole for rhododendron or an azalea or a blueberry. Um, and then thereafter, as many times as you deem necessary, either based on soil test or in things like blueberries, just knowing how acid loving they are, you'll make multiple applications to the soil surface after moving the mulch back. And the other reason for that is we have to remember that um, our, in particular, if we give any kind of supplemental water, our Lake Michigan water is alkaline. So every time we water with our um, artificial water, quote, artificial water uh, that we're getting as opposed to rainwater from Lake Michigan, it's counterbalancing, it's countermanding the effects, the acidifying effects of either the aluminum sulfate or the soil sulfur. So hopefully that's helpful. Watering. Could anything be more important or timely than right now that we're going, we're well into week two of uh, basically extreme heat and drought. And so let's try some, let's see how well you know what the watering um, data is. Sprinkler systems are meant to be a complete answer for all landscape watering needs, be it turf, trees, annuals, perennials, ground cover, etc. Now, if we were in the class face-to-face, -face, I would ask for a show of hands right now, how many of you have sprinkler systems? Um, and, and typically, um, at least 30 to 40% uh, have in-ground systems. Um, this again is false. And the kicker here is the word complete. And the biggest um, problem is trees. Um, 
It's one thing where you have turf that has a relatively shallow, maybe anywhere from three to six inch deep root system, um, annuals, you know, two to four inches, perennials perhaps a little bit deeper, ground cover can vary tremendously. But when you have a tree, uh, an established tree that has a root system that's uh, 15 to 18 to 20 inches deep, we have to think about how long that sprinkler system would have to be on to really get down and to the depth where it's really watering all those root system, all the roots and developing a heavy root system. So, and the other thing is we have a tendency to use sprinkler systems, perhaps not as uh, correctly as we should. It's always better, once a plant is established, it's always better to water deeply and infrequently than to water frequently and lightly. Again, plants are as lazy as we are. And so if the water is always, if we're, if we're sprinkling for five or seven or 10 minutes every other night all summer long, the plant sits back and says, wow, there's always just a little bit of water at the surface. So I really don't wanna work this hard. So I'll start developing my root system right along the surface. So then you have either a lawn or you have a vegetable garden or you have shrubs that simply don't have a stocky, uh, deep root system. You know, there's something to be said for making these plants once they get established to work a little bit and develop a heavier root system. And then when we get in times of stress, such as we have right now, you have a deeper root system that may be able to find water um, that is down in the subsoil. So this is really, really important. Um, water deeply, but infrequently, rather than shallow and frequent. If you're not sure when to water, allowing plants to wilt is a useful indicator that it's time to water. I'm sure we've all done this either, um, maybe not purposely, but on a hot day like, like we've just been having, um, it's very easy to come home from work and something that you watered early in the morning is wilted. So the answer to this is this is also false. Have to remember every time a plant wilts, that is huge stress on it. And so whether it's a tomato, um, you're going to affect future um, flower production and fruit production. If it is a rose or if it's a, a container full of annuals or a container full of herbs, if any time those plants are allowed to wilt, growth potential is lost. And so you're affecting the per future performance of whatever you're expecting from that plant. Again, whether it's flowers or fruit or foliage or whatever. Um, the other thing is that if you allow that to be your indicator and that happens time after time after time, say on a hydrangea um, out in more sun, what will happen is after a few times, the cells around the tips and the edges will die. And that's when someone brings a sample into the store like that and we see that, um, we always know that at some point in time, the plant has been allowed to dehydrate multiple times. And it's always at the edges and the tip because the plant is using whatever water it has and it's trying to get the water to the stems and to the leaf surface, but the edges and the tips are the very last thing to get the water. And when the plant runs short of water, those are the cells that will have to be sacrificed. So allowing plants to wilt is not a useful indicator that it's time to water. Once deciduous plants have lost their leaves in the fall, it isn't necessary to water anymore. I'll let you think about that one. Um, again, once deciduous plants have lost their leaves in the fall, it isn't necessary to water anymore. Uh, again, this is another one that is false. Just because a deciduous plant doesn't have any leaves doesn't mean it doesn't have water needs. You know, you still, this is really important to understand, as long as soil temperatures, not air temperatures, as long as soil temperatures are above 40 degrees, the perennial plants that are in a landscape, the trees, the shrubs, the perennials, the ground cover, um, they are still, even though there's nothing that you're seeing, you're not seeing active growth above ground, 
what's happening is you still have root proliferation. And so in particular, if these are plants that are um, deciduous plants or evergreens that are newly planted or maybe perhaps a year old, if we have had a very, very, very dry fall, it is always a good idea to go out and give periodic deep waterings. You don't want plants to go into the winter uh, dehydrated or stressed or not have good reserves of water to call upon over the course of the winter. So that's really, 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 really important to, uh, to understand. Annual rainfall is cumulative for plants. So if we've had a wet spring, there is little need to water later. Well, that one's pretty straightforward. Um, this is, a, again, this is a perfect example. This is the third May in a row now, according to all of our local weather forecasters at the end of the month, that absolutely we had record shattering rainfall. And now, um, you know, two weeks later, with two weeks of 90 degree temperatures, we're in a situation where we have we were getting to the point we were having drought till we had these last little showers these last several nights. Um, or if you wanted a, an analogy that's a little closer to home, um, you had six glasses of water two days ago. Do you need water today? Absolutely, and the plant is exactly the same way. So this is another false. Watering in the heat of the day will burn foliage. I'm not sure where everybody got this idea and evidently somewhere along the line, um, someone has uh, propagated the idea that a drop of water on a plant acts as a magnifying glass and is going to burn the plant to death. And that just isn't the case. So this is false and this brings up the point that nothing is more important than watering a plant when it needs it. So for heaven's sake, um, if you go out at noon and you haven't watered your containers for a couple of days and everything is wilting, you put your finger in the pot and you touch the soil surface and it's bone dry, uh, for heaven's sake, don't worry about getting a little water on the foliage. The sun is not going to burn the foliage to a crisp. Get out there and water. That's, you know, the important thing is when a plant needs water, just like you, when you need a drink of water, that's when you need the water. You need it immediately. So, and that also gets back to the previous question about do we want to wait until a plant wilts to use that as the indicator of water? No. In a perfect world, you would always be watering just ahead of the time that the plant starts wilting or showing signs of um, drought stress. The, the one thing that might that is true about this is whenever you're watering plants when we get into this kind of heat and humidity, especially things that have any kind of an inclination to get fungal, fungal diseases, most of these fungal diseases, uh, or many of them I should say, require moisture on the leaf surface for long periods of time to germinate and grow down into the cells and start causing problems. So when you're watering in during the day or night or whenever, um, anything that you can do to keep the water off the foliage, and that's why I, I don't know how people garden without those long handle watering wands that have the bubblers or the breakers on the end so that you soften the force of the water, but that way you can reach down in underneath, whether it's a container or whether it's a tree or a shrub, but you can get the water right to the soil and keep it off the foliage as much as possible. So, so far, nothing has been true. These have all been false if you're keeping score. I think I've already answered this one. If a plant is wilted, it always needs to be watered. Um, true or false? This one is actually false as well. And this really, really, really confuses people. I wanna spend a minute on this one. If a, pl a plant can be wilted, if it is surprisingly too wet or too dry. So the example I gave earlier, when you come home at noon and you walk out on your patio to look at your beautiful containers and they're all wilted, don't make the assumption that they are necessarily dry. You always want to put your finger in there or do a visual inspection, look at the color of the soil, feel the soil for moisture. Surprisingly, 
plants do exactly the same thing if it's too wet or too dry. They will wilt in both cases. The difference being that if you water the plant and you go back and check it three day, three hours later and it is still wilted, what that means is the soil was already at carrying capacity. It was already saturated. So the oxygen spaces that should have existed in the soil were full of water and plants need oxygen to transport water. So if it's waterlogged, the plant will wilt. If it is bone dry, the plant will wilt. The only difference being that the, um, when you add water, if it perks up, then it was too dry. If it stays wilted, it was already too wet. So this is really, really kind of a crucial thing. And so you, again, I want to emphasize, you have to be a little bit careful uh, when it's this hot, when it's 95 degrees or approaching 100 degrees in the middle of the day, and you come home and your hydrangeas are wilty, but you watered the heck out of them the night before, and you think, how can this be? Are they dry? Do I have to water again? You need to check that soil surface because when it's this hot, what will happen is the rate of water loss through the leaves and the big flowers when the hydrangeas start blooming is faster than the root system can replace it. So it doesn't necessarily mean that the soil is dry. It just means that the plants, it's so hot, the plants are losing water faster than the root system can replace it. And you might, if the soil feels moist, you might want to wait an hour or two or after the plants have been in shade for a while and check and see if the plants have started recovering uh, before you make the assumption that you need to water. So that's kind of an important difference to understand. So if anything, this might be one of the most important questions to really think about and take to heart um, for, the, for the sake of your garden, your garden plants. I'm going to have a few questions about fertilizing. Fertilizing trees and shrubs in the fall makes them more susceptible to winter damage. This also is mainly false. I know if you notice an absolute, it's either true or false. So it's false. But again, growing up, one of the things that I was always taught is, oh, you mustn't fertilize in the fall because if you do it too early, if you do it in September, early October, what you could do is you could stimulate new growth on the plants. And then if we have a sudden change rather than a gradual change from warm to cold, or if it's a warm fall, then all of a sudden the curtain comes down and it gets cold very, very quickly, that new growth would be softer and more succulent and might be more susceptible to winter damage. Generally speaking, when people ask me what the best guideline is to do fall fertilization, I say if you wait until you start seeing good fall color on the trees and the shrubs. By then you can apply the fertilizer and there is virtually no possibility of encouraging new growth. The plants are already heading into dormancy. And so they're, they're all focused on making food and sending that food down low in the plant to store it in the root system and the lower portions of the plant. And so, that's an excellent time to fertilize and then the plants will have all those stored foods ready to go in the spring when they come out of winter dormancy. Trees and shrubs should be fertilized with the complete NPK fertilizer. So in that, uh, N is for nitrogen and that is for leaf and stem growth of leaf color. P is for phosphorus and that is for flowering and fruiting and K, the potassium or potash, um, generally is for uh, cellular metabolism and winter hardiness and cell wall strength. So insect resistance, in particular disease resistance uh, with phosphorus. Nitrogen is the most mobile element. And so you can fertilize your lawn with a high nitrogen fertilizer. Um, and if you've done it this year, the first of May with all of the rain that we've had, a lot of that nitrogen would have been leached on through and down beyond the root zone and the lawn might not have been able to make good use of it. So this is the first true response question. Trees and shrubs, if, when you're going to fertilize trees and shrubs, um, when you fertilize, it should have a percentage of nitrogen, a percentage of phosphorus, a percentage of uh, potash uh, on the label. 
pruning. Everybody wants to know how to prune. So we've got a few questions about that. Pruning evergreens back to the same size every year is a widely accepted and horticulturally sound practice. Well, clearly it's a widely accepted practice when you drive up and down the streets in any neighborhood where you see the evergreens, particularly the ewes, have been sheared to the bottom of the window, um, to the edge of the sidewalk, to keep them in bondage and keep them um, where the homeowner wants them to be. So widely accepted, yes. Horticulturally sound, no, it is not. And the reason for that is that regardless of the type of evergreen that you're growing, every different species has a predetermined, a genetically predetermined life expectancy. And on many things, it's three years. And what happens is as the plant continues to grow, if you don't prune it, it gets denser on the outside and nature in her infinite wisdom says, wow, these needles, these leaves, if you will, on the inside of the plant aren't seeing sunlight. They're not photosynthesizing. They're not contributing anything to the health and well-being of the plant. So I'm just going to shed those and drop those to the ground and just keep the most current two years growth on the outer edges where it's catching sun. What happens when we prune these ewes or the arbovita back to exactly the same size, in particular the ewes, those are the ones that really seem to get um, the hardest whacking every, every year. Um, regardless of whether you trim them back to the same size or don't, the plant doesn't care. The plant is going to continue to shed the oldest growth every year in the center. And what happens is where you see these plants that have been pruned to fit the space where they've been growing for years and years and years. If you part the branches and you look on the inside, you have the skeleton of bare branches, no leaves, and you have maybe, I've seen as little as a half an inch layer of foliage across the top and down around the sides and the front and back. That's not a lot of surface area. And I love the analogy that needles are like little solar panels and they are taking, you know, they're taking the energy from the sun, they're photosynthesizing, they're storing carbohydrates to build up their strength and their reserves. So leaf surface um, is correlated with vigor of the plant. The more leaves the plant has, the more it can photosynthesize, the stronger it will be. So every time that we prune a plant back to make it fit, especially an evergreen, to make it fit the space, um, we are weakening that. And so I know the question is going to be, well, what do I do? It's over the sidewalk. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's over the windows. Then, so that's really kind of a call to us that when you are ready to re-landscape and you're ready to start over again, um, really pay attention to, you know, what the size constraints are and what the mature height and what the mature spread is. Don't just look at it because it's pretty. Understand how big the plant is going to get in the future. And the other thing is prune it a little bit every year and slow it down. Don't wait until it gets to the point where you want it to be to fill the space or to be under that window and then start pruning because you won't have a density of branching. Pruning will make the plant, if you prune every single year, the plant will get denser and fuller and you'll have more leaves and you'll not only be slowing it down, but you'll be developing a lot more surface area for the future and the plant will be healthier. Make flush cuts when pruning branches. Um, this is where I really wish that we were in class together and I had a board where I could draw a picture for you. Um, if you look just to the left of where the top part of the pruners are. If you look at that branch, it's kind of heading off the screen toward us. You'll see a little ridge of cells there. And that is called a branch collar. And they're very, very, very specialized cells there. And those will promote healing. So whenever you're doing pruning, whether it's a tree or a shrub, you always want to look for that little swelling um, where the tree or where the branch joins the trunk that it's attached to. And you want to prune just beyond that, leaving that ring of cells. 
So not only do you have a smaller surface to heal, but you've left all of those specialized cells that are in that branch collar and it will heal much, much, much more quickly. So making flush cuts when pruning branches is not the correct way. You want to prune just beyond what would be a flush cut. Leave that, and you know, after this class, go out and take a look, uh, find a tree in your yard and take a look and look at it from the side and you will see around each one of those branches, you'll see that little swollen ring of cells and you always want, when you're pruning, you prune beyond that, leaving those cells to heal more quickly. Asphalt emulsion wound dressings promote faster healing of pruning cuts. And it was interesting, I was talking to a customer on the phone yesterday and I was talking to him about pruning and this exact thing came up. Uh, and again, this shows how long I've been in horticulture. We've probably known now that this is not true for 15 or more years. And I feel really good about our ethics. Um, we stopped selling that as soon as we found out that that was uh, not a good practice. And it is not a good practice because the research indicates that if you make a cut and there's any kind of moisture on the surface of that cut and you spray with those tar, those black tar dressings. And, and you know, we've all seen it. We've all used them many, many, many years ago. But that will actually seal that moisture into the branch and it can promote um, decay and wounds uh, that don't heal very quickly. So this is important. If you have those in the garage, that would mean you've had them for a while, throw them away. And if you go someplace and you see that they still have those on the shelves, do not buy them because that is not a product that works. That is not good horticultural practice to use these uh, black tree emulsion uh, or asphalt emulsion wound dressings. Lawns. Right now, lawns have just, you know, lawns are really often are one of our very first um, widespread just because we have so much turf. They're really the first things to let us know when we're starting to get into drought, uh, heat and drought. So these are some um, kind of interesting questions. Lawn rollers are the best way to level a lumpy lawn. For those of us that mow our own lawn, we are very cognizant of where the hills and valleys are um, in our lawn. And it's kind of a pain if your lawn is really, really um, rolling. Um, the answer to this, lawn rollers are the best way to level a lumpy lawn. The answer is, this is another false. If a lawn roller was heavy enough to actually even out little minor hills and valleys um, in your lawn, little undulations when the lawn is wet, um, that would not be a good thing because that would mean that it is, again, it is compressing and compacting the soil surface and that clay. And so what you're doing is again, you're making the surface hard, you're driving out the air spaces, you're cutting off the oxygen supply to the roots, you're making the soil more impervious to water, not a good thing. So the obvious question to that, and I'll try and head that question off for later at the end of the session. Um, if you have a situation like that, where you have a definite uh, rise or a definite depression, then what you can do is in a drone's eye view, you get a spade or shovel or something sharp and you make a cross, you, you gently, gently, gently skim the sod back and you make cuts uh, from 12 o'clock to six o'clock and three o'clock to nine o'clock. And if you do it skillfully, you can roll the sod back and you can either remove the soil that's under there until it's level, or you can add soil. And then in a perfect world, you just flip those four pie-shaped wedges of sod back in place, tamp them very, very gently, start watering, and theoretically, um, you've corrected this, the situation. If you have larger areas, then that just means more work. But it's uh, you never want to use a lawn roller um, to do any major uh, changes in elevation or trying to level out a, quote, lumpy lawn. Grass clippings left on lawns contribute to thatch buildup. 
True or false? I'll give you a second to think on this one. This again is actually false. Grass clippings are basically water and nitrogen. And unless you let the lawn, you know, you've gone away to on vacation for three weeks and no one mowed the yard, you come back and it's six inches tall and you make the mistake of mowing it down, you know, not changing the more height and mowing everything and not catching the clippings. Um, it will take a little while to break down, but because they're water and nitrogen, um, a small amount of grass clippings break down very, very quickly. Uh, actually, what I should do is define thatch. Thatch is, if you were to do a cross section, if you took a spade and pried it back and looked at a cross section of turf, what you would find is this little, just above the soil and the roots, you would find this spongy layer of wiry brown um, accumulation of debris. Well, that debris is not grass clippings. It is actually old stems that have not broken down yet right at the base of the plant. And it's also the top of the root system. So it's the wiry, um, harder parts that take longer to break down that actually contribute to thatch buildup. And so typically we say any time that that accumulation is more than three quarters of an inch deep, you may want to think about doing dethatching. Um, and I'm sorry, core aerating. Please, 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 please don't. I need to erase tape on that. I'll just roll back. Never, never, never dethatch. So I might as well talk about that right now. Dethatching is a machine that you can buy at any of, or rent at any of the rental uh, places. And it has little fingers, like little forks. And you drive that you push this machine like a lawnmower through the turf and these, these forks go back and forth. And basically what they're doing is they are fingering everything up and dropping these big piles. Now, in fairness, there is a lot of thatch in there, but there's also a lot of live grass. And again, I love Jennifer's analogy that I heard her say once years and years ago. Um, would you take a steel brush or a curry comb that you would use on a horse and would you use that to comb your hair? And is that the best thing to do is to go through and try and pull out as much of your hair as you possibly can. That's exactly what you do with these dethatching the de machines. So please don't do dethatching. If your lawn service says, I wanna dethatch your lawn, tell them that you don't want it to be dethatched. If your thatch layer is three quarters of an inch or more, you may want to consider core aeration, which is a different machine. And again, it's a, it's a very heavy duty and you push it like a lawnmower and it has um, plugs. It takes soil plugs and as it as this rolls over the lawn, it goes down in, it pulls up pieces of soil and thatch and drops them on top of the lawn. So after you've had uh, the, the coriation done, it looks like you've had an army of giant um, Canadian geese walking through the yard. You have these droppings, uh, these cores of soil all over the soil. The cool thing about that is, and why that is different, is that actually punches through the thatch. So it allows water, it allows oxygen, it allows fertilizer, it allows seed to get down into the back, into the root zone and also allows the bacteria and the soil microbes to start working because you brought them from below the soil surface from underneath that thatch and you've now deposited a large population of them on top of the soil surface. So like little uh, Pac-Men, they can start working on that thatch and breaking that down. And uh, that's really the way to attack thatch. Best time to do that is in the fall. So uh, when you're doing your lawn renovation, um, anytime late August into October, uh, you can do de, uh, you can do core aeration, not dethatching. Turf grass can survive on as little as a half an inch of rain per month. Okay, I know we're going to catch some people on this one. This is actually true. The research has been done, and if you um, want to save money on water, um, you want to be ecologically correct and reduce your water uh, usage, 
um, and you want to prioritize. And the first thing to do is to save your trees and shrubs. Um, with turf grass, if you give it as little as one half an inch of rain per month, it will keep the turf alive. Now it'll be dormant, it'll be brown, but theoretically, unless it you know, gets to 110 degrees, in which case it might need a little more than that, but the, the very core of the plant will still be alive. It will just be dormant and waiting for cooler temperatures and more moisture, whether you, whether it's in the form of watering artificially or whether it's rainfall and it will start growing out again. So you can, you can minimize your water use or you can reprioritize it and use that water for your trees and shrubs um, if you can stand looking at a lawn that is brown, brown, brown. But one half an inch of moisture per month should keep your turf alive but dormant until conditions are better for it to uh, start growing again. Eco-friendly techniques. Organic fertilizers feed the soil and soil microbes as much as the plants. That is absolutely true. So while these uh, things like the, the Dr. Earth products or the Espoma products that are earth friendly that we like so much uh, do have nitrogen, phosphorus, potash, many of them have the little micronutrients, um, the more minor elements like uh, calcium and iron and zinc and whatever, just as we need with our, our vitamins. Um, these organic fertilizers actually help contribute to microbial uh, growth and fungal growth in the soil. And that we mustn't underestimate how important the work of those soil microbes is, breaking down organic matter and breaking that down into the nutrients that plants use uh, as the building blocks for um, good growth. True or false, sluggo, uh, an organic, an iron phosphate, an organic slug control uh, is effective in controlling slug damage. This is actually false because it says organic. Um, the active ingredient in sluggo, which does an amazing job, um, sluggo is iron phosphate and it is on a wheat-based carrier. And so when the slugs come out after a hot day and they've been resting all day in the cool mulch, um, they come out to start feeding on your hostas or on some of your other things. Um, when they encounter the sluggo, they are just, it's that, that wheat base that it's on is irresistible to them. They eat it, they take up the iron phosphate. It gives them a really, really, really bad tummy ache and they stop eating and they crawl away to wherever slugs crawl away to, to die. And in about three days, um, they will be dead. So this is false only in the fact that this is organic. This is not carbon based. Um, so it's iron phosphate based, so it is not organic per se, but does, it's a very, very, very safe um, product to be using. And that is, that kind of finishes the 24 question quiz. Um, give yourself a grade. Uh, I hope this was helpful to you. Uh, please, by all means, if you have questions, this is the time to submit those and we'll see if anything pops up on the screen. I'll give you a few seconds to uh, either figure out how to do that or figure out your questions. And my very competent assistant will come and assist me since when they show up, I probably won't know how to get them up. Okay, does anyone have any questions about anything, even if it doesn't have to do, if it doesn't pertain to myths and fables of horticulture? Okay. Here, here they come. All right, great. Uh, Marnie asks, can you rejuvenate prune arborvita? When I see the term rejuvenate prune, uh, that means that someone is doing something. Um, they they want to take it back. The plant is no longer serviceable. It's outgrown its space. Marnie, you can do that to a certain extent, but unlike yous, Arbovita do not have um, any kind of leaf buds, dormant leaf buds, back on bare wood. So you can cut back as far as um, you have green growth on there, 
But once you get back, if you have a bare thumb or a bare wood uh, sitting there, if you cut back to that, that's it. It's all over. So you have to stay on new growth. You have you should have at least probably uh, half to three quarters of an inch of new growth of foliage on there, but not farther than that. A U is an exception. A U you can cut back to very, very, very old wood, and they will have dormant buds up and down the stems that will be growing. The other thing is when you do rejuvenation pruning like that, you want to do it in stages because again, every time you take off surface area, you're weakening the plant. And so the best time to do any kind of rejuvenation would be when the plant is dormant because in the fall, it sends all its stored foods down low in the root system and the lower portions of the plant. So any kind of extreme removal of top growth of the plant, you're not stressing the plant as much as you would. You would never do a hard rejuvenation prune uh, on an arborvitae or shouldn't do it during the growing season. Okay, Alyssa, I have a new dawn climbing rose. Sometimes I see spots on some of the leaves. I heard new dawn is disease resistant. Is it better to prune those leaves or the stem to where there are no spotted leaves or just leave it alone and let it do its thing? Um, probably talking about black spot. And one of the things that I read years and years ago and I practiced it for many years and told many people about it, um, disease resistance is variable. And to a certain point when you start getting the kind of heat and humidity and we all the moisture that we had in May, a lot of leaves have been inoculated. So one of the things that you can do with roses um, is if you're, you know, New Dawn is a climber, so this doesn't pertain as much, but on regular shrub roses, once they get 24 inches tall or taller early, you know, June, mid-June, what you can do is get a bucket um, or some kind of a container and put your gloves on and strip off the bottom six inches of the leaves before they start getting black spot. So what you're doing is you're taking all the leaves off the bottom six inches of the plant and you're opening up the stems so that you can get better air circulation. That's why black spot always starts at the bottom of the plant because that's where the, the canes are closest together. There, there's more overlap. Those are the very, very last leaves to um, receive air and to dry off. And so that's why black spot starts from the bottom and works up. So you can do that as a, a kind of a cultural control when we get into June, when plants are 18 to 20 inches tall, you can strip off the bottom six inches of the leaf. With the new dawn, with a climber, don't cut the stems off. Just the minute you see um, leaves start, starting to get black spot, just tear them off and pick them off the ground and don't compost them and throw them away. Should you apply sluggo as a preventative or only when you see signs of slug damage? Um, to me, if you've been in the house more than a year and you know the history, if you know what plants are susceptible and it's not always just hostas, very often there will be other plants that have leaves, um, especially a lot of shade plants like Ligularia will get it uh, because it, it grows in cooler, damper areas and the way the leaves kind of rest on the ground, those are the last soil surfaces to dry out. Though all those things add and encourage um, slugs. So to me, it's a matter of if you've had the issue in the past or you have particular varieties of hosta that you know, um, what I would do is put it down when you do a spring cleanup because slugs will start showing up when soil temperatures start approaching 60 degrees. So if you can control that overwintering population, you know, slugs aren't terribly mobile. So if you can control that overwintering generation, uh, you'll dramatically reduce your incidence of disease um, for later on in the season. The other thing to do is um, I, quite frankly, all of my hostas, um, especially the varieties that I know are susceptible, I have made sure that I don't, I no longer mulch them. I pull the mulch all the way out to the edge of the drip line of those because slugs do not like a dry soil surface. Anything as they crawl over, anything that has a little bit of grit or anything that disturbs that mucus coating on their bodies uh, allows them to dehydrate and die. So they're very loath to do that. They are looking for soft, moist places to crawl across. So by reducing the uh, soil surface um, uh, moisture, 
that, is, that alone is a great cultural way to reduce your amount of uh, slug damage. Kara asks, how do you treat magnolia scale? I think heat and humidity brought it on this year as I didn't have it on the tree before. Um, that's not exactly true. Um, like all biological populations, insects, whatever, um, it rises and it falls. And from one, and there are predators that will take uh, affect magnolia scale and reduce the populations. But this is one of those things for those of you that don't have a magnolia or have never had magnolia scale. These are the biggest scales we have, and it's a little bit analogous to you walking around with leeches on your body. It's extremely draining, and I have seen big established magnolias killed in two years without treatments. So, um, Kara, why don't you come in and we will show you there are systemics that you mix with water, you apply to the, as a drench to the base of the plant, they go into the soil solution, they go up into the leaf and stem tissue, and as those scales are sucking out the plant juices, they take out the insecticide and it does a really, 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 really good job. Um, I've heard that sluggo can cause a fungus to grow that kills the plants. True or false? Um, that is news to me. Again, it's iron phosphate based. Um, I try and do a lot of reading. I try and keep up. Um, Cindy, I have never seen that or heard that. That doesn't mean it's not true. It just means I have never seen it. And in the 33 years I've been here at Chalet, you know, we've had sluggo for well over a decade. I've never had someone come in and that said that sluggo has incited anything in their yard. Um, can you prune a yew to save it from dying away? Um, this is where a class would be a better place for this because I could ask you more. When you say dying away, do you mean is the plant literally dying or is the plant just getting thin in the center? Um, when a yew starts getting rusty orangey brown, um, and branches are dying, typically that indicates excessive water. Use our camels, and they really, really, really um, don't like to be wet feet. So even the first year that you plant a you, better to keep it drier than wetter. If you're talking about, can I prune it to keep it from dying in the center? Um, yes, that's really, that's what the rejuvenation pruning is. Um, you would be opening up and, and exposing those inner branches and giving them an opportunity to regrow again. Uh, from Larry, how far can back can you prune grapevines? Um, when the plants are dormant, you can prune grapevines back very severely. In fact, that's generally what you want to do. Uh, you want to probably keep anywhere from, um, you want to keep four renewal branches every year with anywhere from eight to 12 buds on each one of those shoots because each one of those shoots has the potential to become a, cl a cluster of grapes later. But that is done as dormant pruning, uh, probably best in March or April. Um, okay, we've already done that one. Is there, oh, this is a good question. Is there any use for 10, 10, 10? Um, anytime we have a customer that comes in and says, I use 10, 10, 10 on my shrubs, I use 10, 10, 10 on my uh, flowers, I tend to think of that as, a, as an inexpensive farm fertilizer um, that you may have gotten for a great price at a box store. Um, buyer beware. Typically these 10, 10, 10s are not formulated so that there's any kind of um, variability in the way the nutrients are released and they can be what we call hot. So the minute you put them on, um, they may start releasing whether they get moisture or not. And it's very, very, very much easier um, to burn anything, whether it's turf, whether it's a shrub, whether it's a grapevine, when you use a 10, 10, 10, because they are just innately, they're not formulated for a slow or gradual release. They're formulated for rapid release. And so you have to be very careful about not burning with those. Um, Marion says, thank you. Bup, 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 bup. And I think those are all the questions. So I appreciate everyone that attended and look forward in next Wednesday's e-blast to what the class is going to be. And I thank you for attending. Have a great weekend. Stay cool.